Hello, everyone. Welcome back to the Divine Feminine Healers podcast. I am so excited to have Paula on the podcast. She's a Vedic astrologer and business coach. Thank you for being here today. Thanks for having me. So a question that I always ask everyone who is on my podcast podcast is how do you connect with the divine feminine energy? That's such a beautiful question. I mean, like day to day, I feel like I keep a relationship to actual devatas, as we say in the Vedic tradition. So there's like Lakshmi, I do the Sri Suktam. There's, so there's a lot of chanting that goes on at my house. Um, but you know, more, I guess, practically speaking, just being in nature, we have a 168 acre or 160 acre farm. And so we've got a garden kind of bursting at the seams right now. So just being out there on the dirt with, you know, my hands in the dirt, like pulling things out and, and cooking with fresh vegetables and stuff. And that really connects me to my feminine center. Mm. I love both of those. And I listen, I listen to your podcast. I love it. And I hear you talk about chanting so much and how it's such a foundational practice for you in healing. And I think that is such a good example for all the women in our community, because I really link chanting to visibility and being able, like very much the throat chakra of being able to be seen and, and voicing. Do you feel like that has been a part of your journey too? Oh, 100%. Yeah. So, you know, in astrology, we look at the second house. That's where we're learning about the traditions, but also it's the throat, you know, and I have Saturn in the second. So for those who don't know, Saturn is the place of our karmas. It's like the difficult things that we have to deal with wherever it's located in the chart, whatever it's touching, it's going to have an impact. So for me, I had a lot of stage fright. I was really afraid to st- say my truth to really like set boundaries. And so chanting and doing other practices you know, really strengthening that muscle has helped me get clearer and clearer. And so like the invitation with Saturn is not to just like push away from those things. It's to actually like lean in and try to figure out what it's asking of us. So yeah, it's definitely been huge for me. If I didn't have chanting, I would be far, far behind (laughs) where I've managed to get in this lifetime. Yeah, that's such a good example. And that's exactly how I like to talk about Saturn and something that I've learned with my mentor so much is how to make right relationship with it. And that's such a beautiful transformation for our community to see. And I definitely relate to that because I have K2 in my second house. So it's definitely something that um, is a part of my journey as well. Yeah, and it has so much to do with money as well. That's where it's, it's like our our commu- uh, accumulated wealth through our family line, you know? So it's all related, right? As we open our voice, as we step into our power, as we become more visible, we also earn more. It's, those two things are equated. Yeah, I love that. So I'm curious how you got into the world of the Vedas and specifically Jyotish. Sure. So I was at a really crucial turning point in my life. I was about 30. I'm 41 now. Um, and I was living in New York city. I was doing yoga, you know, which I loved, but also I was like going out late and partying and like, I had a totally different lifestyle and different values, you know, I mean, fundamentally the same values, but I wasn't a spiritual person. I didn't have any kind of spiritual connection. Yoga for me was about just like feeling good. Um, and then I, I, my relationship fell apart and I was getting a divorce and I literally was like, grasping for anything that could help me understand what I was going through. And so in that moment, a friend told me about a Vedic astrologer. I got a reading and the way that he so clearly saw me um, and spoke to what had happened in the past that I'd never told anybody uh, dynamics within my family. It just kind of shook me and, and in a way that it made me realize there's so much more than what we see on the surface. And immediately, you know, I was in this state where everything, I like left New York, I left my community, I left my therapist, I left my writing group, like I lost like so much. I was completely open to whatever I was receiving. And I went down a rabbit hole very, very quickly and deeply into Jyotish and also learned some about, you know, Ayurveda and other topics. Within a year, I I decided my body just said like, it's time to go to India. Mm-hmm. And so I planned to skip the holidays. Cause it was going to be my first, uh, holidays without my ex-husband. And like, I didn't want to see my family. I didn't want to, you know, I felt like a failure, honestly, you know, I was struggling. 
So I was like, I'm going to go to India. I'm going to get Ayurvedic treatments. I didn't even know what that consisted of, but a friend had recommended a place. And then another friend had said the same place um, and they didn't know each other. So it was kind of interesting. And so I was like, that's what with a friend and I went to Rajasthan and then I ended up at this Ayurvedic clinic. And I said to the person sitting next to me, like, I don't know anything about Ayurveda. And they handed me this book. Okay. The book was Prakriti by Dr. Robert Saboda. Mm. And so I started reading that book. I just devoured it. It felt like uh, food for my soul. And then that next evening at dinner, I was with these two and they happened to be practicing a kind of yoga called shadow yoga, which a friend of mine had recommended I do. And so we're talking about shadow yoga and this person, there's a new person there and he's sitting next to me and he says, oh, I do shadow yoga too. And my friend who's a shadow yoga teacher in the Bay Area is going to be here tomorrow with his family. And at the time I was living in the Bay Area and this was the teacher who had been recommended to me. Whoa. And the person who was saying that was Dr. Robert Svoboda, who was the author of that book. Whoa. So there was just all this like obvious, it's like the universe had to to show me like I was five years old, like this is the path, you know, had to be so obvious. And I tell my clients all the time, like tell the universe, I need a sign that's so clear. Talk to me like I'm five, like, you know, smack me across the face. So I know which direction to go in. So I literally was in that moment. I was just like, okay, I don't know what's going on. I will follow this path. I a hundred percent like dedicate my life to this path. And all these things started to open up as a result of that commitment. And so um, I found a Jyotish teacher in the Bay Area, and I was studying very intensively with him. I was reading charts with Dr. Saboda, who became one of my dearest mentors and friends. Um, and so I got a really fast path introduction, like a dunk in the deep end. <laughs> so yeah, it was, wow. it was beautiful. And I feel so grateful. Yeah, I'm hearing so much surrender and trust. And it's such a beautiful story to like see these synchronicities that align. And you're like, I feel like that aligns with that first initial moment that you had with Vedic astrology where you were like, there's there's no other way. Like there, I'm believing in something higher than myself and trusting in the divine. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, that's just, that's just really beautiful and profound. Thank you for sharing that story. Yeah, yeah, it really changed everything. So... <laughs> I'm curious how now when I see your business, we weave your bliss on Instagram and I love it. I think you give such helpful tips for growing um, a spiritual business and how to make a nourishing amount of like feeling nourished from it and feeling nourished in all accounts. And I think this is something like there's a stigma against it in the spirituality community. Mm. I'm so curious to hear what your journey has been with this. Like, how did you know? okay, this is my calling, because it is so clear that it is your calling, you speak with it with such confidence and clarity. How did you start to segue into how, teaching others how to generate money from their spiritual business? So honestly, I, uh, so my business started doing Ayurveda and astrology and doing general readings, right? So it, it evolved. That's my point is like, don't, don't look at where I am now and be like, oh, she just knew one day that that's exactly what she should do. I did marketing. Uh, I started a nonprofit. Uh, I've started a new site. I've done a lot. I've, I've been an editor. I've been in marketing and social media. I've done all these things in the past before I became a spiritual person, so to say, like before my life changed, I was doing all those things. And even after I kind of had this awakening moment of realizing like what I was here to do, um, like just being with a divine feeling, not knowing exactly what that would look like to make money, but just knowing in my person, like what I was actually here to do was to be a good person, right? And to like try to help other people um, and to do my practices, like that's all I knew, right? Um, but before that I had done all these other things and I had this conception of like, I'm going to, that's not what I'm doing anymore. I'm only going to have this healing spiritual business and that I'm like trying to get that off of my plate. And so the universe of course laughs when we think we know what for six months and Dr. Svoboda had a retreat that I went to like right before I was about to leave. And I just was sitting with him one morning um, at Esalen. And it was like, 
you know, seven in the morning, we're having tea. And I said, Hey, can I just give you some advice about your media presence? <laughs> and I just started listing off these things. I was like, you know, you need to have all your books as audio books. We need, you know, you need to have uh, a YouTube page where you're like sharing, you know, you need to have, you need to be on Facebook. You need to be on Instagram. And I just went through these things and he said, can you write these all down and I'll pay you for, you know, just creating this document. And I did that. And then he was like, now, can you do all these things and I'll pay you? And I was like, <laughs> oh, of course, like I'm about to leave for India and I have a new job, <laughs> you know? So I couldn't say no. Um, So I built his business. I really like experimented our way through like the last 10 years to create this really robust business and on the side started to build my own business. And meanwhile was in, I was giving like free advice to everyone and I would see them take my free advice and then go and make a bunch of money. Wow! <laughs> and I was like, you know what? I should probably charge for this. And I should probably embrace the things that I have learned up into this point and understand that those are valuable. Now to speak to like the mindset stuff, you know, I find a lot and I teach people a lot around being spiritual entrepreneurs, some people don't even embrace that term, but like being spiritual and making money. And there's a lot of things to unpack here, <laughs> but, but first of all, like we abundance is our birthright. Being able to thrive is our birthright. What thriving looks like is probably bigger than you imagined. Thriving is like at least $10,000 a month. Like once I made that amount, I started to realize in my body that I was safe, that I was held that I had enough money to pay all of my bills without fear, that I could even save and create the dreams that I have that are going to, you know, feed hundreds of people, have a retreat center on this land, be able to afford this farm, be able to retire my husband who's turning 64 this week. So like he's worked his whole life and I wanted to give him that opportunity to not work anymore. So um, we have to understand thriving is part of being a spiritual person. It's a part of the path. And we are, we have so much more Shakti, like to talk about the divine feminine, we have so much more Shakti to give to our people when we are well nourished, when we have space, when we're not working back to back, you know, I don't do clients. My one-on-one -on -one calendar and then like, you know, delivering my programs. I'm very spacious about it because I know that I am I'm valuable and I, I want to infuse everything I do with the utmost value. So being paid well, you know, being able to make money is part of that because then I don't have to worry that like each person who comes on a sales call with me is like, I need them. You know, I want the right people to work with me. I don't want to work with just anybody. I want to work with people who I know I can help. So I don't know if that answers your question. Yeah, no, there's there's so many good nuggets. And first, I just want to recognize that I love how you were talking about your transitions with jobs, because I think there's a lot of shame of, oh, I'm not in my dharmic path right now. And like, oh, I'm in between jobs right now. So that was really good for our community to see. Like, it is a slow progression, like, and you kind of have to take following the breadcrumbs, taking one step in front of the other until it's revealed to you. And then it comes and it all comes together and you're like, oh, that's why I was in those jobs before. And that was teaching me and accruing all of this knowledge and value that I'm going to give for this next offering. And that really is what Dharma is. It's like you at the heart of it, like you were saying, like making an offering to the world, like that doesn't change. But what does start to evolve is like the way that the offering looks and, and the services that are provided. So I think that was really helpful. Um, and then I basically what I'm hearing is knowing what your needs and wants are is so important. Like you're like, okay, baseline, this is what I need each month just to get my basic needs met. And now once I'm at that place of safety, I can accrue like, okay, how much do I need to make to make sure that my husband is comfortable in this type of way? Or this is another need that I have that I want to fulfill. Right, exactly. And in my program, Your Magnetic Blueprint, I walk people through that. Like, how do you actually figure out your number? How do you plan for that? And then like visioning and trying to imagine what you want your day to look like, what you want your relationship to your clients to look like. And then also, how do you plan for that within your, your budget, you know, so that you can start to move towards it? For sure. That that's so helpful. And I think right now, what I'm hearing from my community, it's, it's almost hard for them to get really specific on what their even mission statement is and what type of clients, because I think there's a fear of not being able to get clients. There's that scarcity mindset, like, Mm. who's going to even pay for this in the first place 
Um, so there's this resistance to being really specific. So mm. I would love for you to speak to that limiting belief and how you see that showing up with your clients. Yeah. Niching. It's such a good topic. Like we are each an individual niche. <laughs> there's only one of us. There's actually, you know, a lot of times people are like, I'm afraid to, to niche into this small space. Cause who will find me there? Or I'm afraid that this is too like someone else. You're never going to be in competition with someone else. You're never going to be too, you know, you got to do you and what's really true for in a generalization. So when you talk about what you're doing, like if you're an Ayurvedic practitioner, I work with a lot of Ayurvedic practitioners. So if you're just saying I'm an Ayurvedic practitioner, like think about a doctor. They're not like, I'm a doctor. They're <laughs> like, I'm a cardiologist in Chicago. Right. And those are two <laughs> things that are differentiators that are getting people to search for that. Right. Um, so uh, it's important that we not be afraid to say I'm an Ayurvedic practitioner that helps women with fertility issues mm. have children, right? Because then the people with fertility issues are like, oh, that's me. I'm going to watch what this person is saying and doing so that I can better see if they're fit for me, right? And that's why being consistent online then comes in so that we're creating content. We're creating like a portfolio of information because what do you do? Think about what you do when you're looking for somebody, you type something specific. And when you find their info, I, what I do is I'll go to their Instagram or I'll listen to them where they were on a podcast. And I'll be like, am I vibing with this person? Do I think this person has what I need to help me? And then I'm already half sold. Right. And then I go look at their offerings and I'm like, is this a price point I'm willing to pay? Is this the right time? Right. So, so think about it from their client experience. Like they're, they're going to narrow down into your niche first. <laughs> so if you don't have a niche, then they're not going to be looking for you. They're going to be, you know, maybe they'll enjoy some of your content online, but generalists work really hard online with sales, like with um, content generation, and they don't make a lot of money mm. unless they're like a big name, you know? For sure. And I think it also comes from, like, I had this conversation with um, the woman in my program yesterday of, well, I want, what do your clients get from, like, what results do they get from working with you? And it's like abundance, fulfillment, and feeling contentment. It's like, yes. And specifically, what does that mean? What does that look like in their lives? And I think that specificity is, again, like so important so that you can really niche and find that that one client that you can really serve on that level. Because then also it's expanding your energy too much too, because you're not going to be able to serve everyone, like you said. Like you mm. are so like astute at a very specific type. You have so many skills and gifts that are really specific. And something that I've just been dipping my toes in is seeing how that is really related to as you call it our Vedic blueprint, it's like in our chart. Is that something that you also teach in your programs? Um, I teach people how to digest planetary energies, how to understand how the planets move through them. When I'm working one-on-one -on -one with a client, we definitely dive deep into the chart and we unpack different tendencies, different obstacles, zone of genius, um, and even plan offers based on that and based on divine timing. So for them, particular timing, it would be auspicious for them to launch something or to do an event. Um, so yeah, <laughs> does that answer your question? Yeah, super cool. I'm curious to hear what challenges have been top of mind for your clients as of late. Well, um, you know, this week I've been doing a, a lot of work with clients around boundaries. And I think it's interesting how that we can do so much work around that in our life. And then we get into business and we're charging for something. And all of a sudden it's like your boundaries can go out the window and you have to be like, oh yeah, I, I still have the cookie. They still want the cookie. They're paying me for the cookie, you know? <laughs> and it's okay to say no. If someone's paying you, you're actually that the person holding the container, you know, and sometimes they need to hear no or they need to have a boundary set for them to have the best experience in whatever that container is. So we've been doing that work. And then also pricing is always, it's always something, it's always something to work on because it's important to like reverse engineer to understand how much time you have and how much something should cost because you know what your number is and all my clients know what their number is. So I'm like, all right, you have room for six clients because you're busy mom 
you're a single mom and you, you know, have only this much time. So let's do the math and figure out how much an hour of your time is worth with your clients. And it's hard sometimes to, to, like you said, imagine somebody's going to pay that. Um, but it's important to understand that when we pay for something, we show up, we do the work and I've seen it again and again. Like when I don't charge enough, people don't value the thing. And when I charge enough that I know it's the right amount for me, it's the right amount for them. I'm holding the container. They're having a distinct experience. Powerful things happen. I know the first time I hired a coach, I was literally like sweating. I was like, oh my God, I can't believe I'm paying this much. It's more than my mortgage. Like it was a lot, but you know what? I doubled my income that month. Just from making that decision, it lit a fire under me and it it made me, it made my creativity come alive and made me create a new offer. You know, it made me think, okay, I'm going to move ahead faster than I would have. It's a little uncomfortable, but it's like Tantra, you know, it's like something that forges us. Um, so yeah. That, I have a lot to say about pricing. I could talk about it for a whole episode. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I totally agree with that. I even noticed that with my different funneling options with my membership is at a lower price point compared to my program that's at a higher price point. And the lack of commitment that happens on that different level is just so wild, right? And it also, mm. if I'm doing like freebies, whether, and then I just started charging for this challenge that I did. And already I'm just seeing more aligned clients come through. Um, and that's such a, for me, that's such a mind warp um, of being able to see that from that different perspective. Mm, totally. So I love that you use this vocabulary of zone of genius. I think that that is super smart. And I'm curious, what are those checkpoints that you find in the Vedic blueprint that begin to signify their zone of genius? So first of all, zone of genius comes from Gay Hendricks, the book, The Big Leap, which I highly recommend to your, your listeners. Um, he talks about the zone of genius and the zone of excellence. So the zone of excellence are things that we do really well. I think with niching, people can be like, but I love all these things and I don't want to leave any behind. So I always tell my clients to pull the thing forward that you is your zone of genius. And those other things, it's like the diva and the the background chorus doesn't leave the diva. They're still there. You know, you can still use your Reiki or whatever you want to bring forward in a session, but you're pulling one thing forward and niching with that so that people can identify themselves. So um, the zone of genius can be seen in a chart by looking at different things. So there's combinations of planets that we call yogas. Hmm. It's kind of confusing, but there's different combinations and they can be activated at different points in the life. Like, um, for example, the Saraswati yoga, the goddess Saraswati, um, is the goddess of tradition, knowledge, arts, creativity. Uh, and so when you see that, that combination in someone's chart, it means that part of their zone of genius is going to be through creativity, through the arts, mm. through teaching traditions, something along those lines. Um, and so then we look for confluence. We look like if one of those planets is activated, what's the ruling planet? Where is it located? Like ruling planet in the fifth can often mean that somebody is going to be a teacher or they're going to be a creator or they're going to write books. Um, the fourth house also has to do with teaching. So, you know, maybe if they have something going on with their ninth, it'll have to do with spirituality. So there's all these different things that we can look for. Um, so for your audience, like if they're looking to start a business, knowing what's going on with Mars and the sun is going to be really important because those two planets are, are really helpful for being independent and like making your own way in work. If you have Saturn kind of in influencing your work, that'll make you less likely to be brave enough to step out. It may be like inviting you to do that, but there may be a lot of fear whatever Saturn's aspecting can also affect that. I find that because I have Saturn aspecting Mercury, I attract a lot of clients who have that. And basically what that is, is it makes it difficult to think outside the box. It makes it like you're a little bit timid to take risks. It can also affect like how you show up on social media, your visibility. So you have to do like certain work. You have to practice in certain ways to kind of break through that tendency. So- I don't know if that answers your question, but we're just talking about some chart 
details. <laughs> yeah, that's so it's so helpful because it really is so specific that like I think because Western astrology can be so general and it can be used for like anyone, it's harder for people to grasp when we try to explain Vedic astrology that it really is looking at your personal chart and all these unique dynamics because it's kind of like um, a chemical experiment. It's like how they really interact with each other. Like it's not just the placement of your fourth house, but what other planets are aspecting it. So I think that gives people a really good clarity that when you're getting at least a service from you, especially, it's going to be so specific to their needs and their zone of genius and their gifts. Mm, totally. And something that came up too, I am curious of your thoughts on social media. So if like, let's say someone is so adverse to using social media, um, do you think in this day and age that we can really grow a business completely in person marketing and not having a social media account? Look, I tell all my clients that the best possible people you can get are referrals. Word of mouth is by far the best way to go. If you've been doing the work that you do for 10 years and you have raving fans where you live, you can run a business, a successful business by telling them to tell other people. That will only take you so far financially though. Mm -hmm. Once you've filled your programs with all those people, then what? If you have a one-on-one -on -one option, Will there be a point at which they graduate out of that? I mean, ideally what we're doing is helping people with a transformation, a core transformation, and then they're moving into our next offering and then our next offering, right? But at some point, those people will go out of that offering. And of course we can ask them for referrals, <laughs> but, you know, ideally, you know, what I tell my clients who are resistant to social media is what is it about social media that you're resistant to? Is it the being visible? Cause we can unpack that. Is it the, the, that it feels like you're too old or that like, what is it? Um, is it the actual medium? Would you do better on a podcast? Um, you know, like Jenna Kutcher, who's like a really famous, she does the gold digger podcast, right? <clears throat> she doesn't like to be visible, but she's made a ton of money and she has this incredibly popular podcast. So you don't have to show up if you don't like being visible, you can show up with your voice. You can show up, you know, um, in email, you can write really amazing emails that inspire people, but you have to do something. If you want to expand your lead pool, you have to do something. Um, and so it's just trying with me, I just try to figure out what my clients would be most suited to, and then help them create a rhythm in that place. Yeah, it's so helpful. I think you nailed it of like really finding the root of where is the resistance to showing up on social media if it's there, because ultimately, if we're going to go to in person marketing, but we're carrying those same limiting beliefs with us, it's going to be like the same cycle over and over again. And there's only going to be a minimal amount of um, expansion that you're going to experience with that. Yeah, I love to help my clients love sales mm. and make it fun. Like as a spiritual person, how can we embrace sales, you know, cause we're everything, every conversation we're having is basically a sales conversation, whether we know it or not, you know, and, and people are, are being converted already before we even open our mouth and make an offering. <clears throat> so how can we share our genius? Sorry, I got to cl clear my throat. <clears throat> how can we share our genius and like, let them, um, opt in, so to speak like earlier than that. So yeah. I mean, sometimes it's about selling. Sometimes it's about visibility. There's always something underneath that. Yeah. I love that. Um, I'm curious to hear what are your thoughts on some of the planetary shifts that we are experiencing right now? So we have major planets in retrograde, Saturn and Jupiter and yeah, or any other transits that are happening right now that you find are really important that our audience can learn from. Sure. So, um, you know, Saturn and Jupiter are the, the slowest moving planets and that way they have a huge transformational effect on us. Um, and in 2020, they came together in the grand conjunction, which happens every 20 years, but this one was unique because they were actually closer than they had been in 800 years. Wow. Um, so when you think about like what was happening about 800 years ago, it was just before the, the plague. <laughs> and so I went back and read um, this, this book by Barbara Tuchman, which you don't have to read if you're not like a history buff, but it was about the 13th century and like what happened during that time, how there was this big plague. And then there was just infighting for years. 
And so I found it kind of interesting given like how things are going in our times. But the real invitation when these two planets meet is for us to really step into our gifts, like beyond, beyond, because it's a time where humanity can make huge leaps forward or slip back into a kind of dark age. So we have the choice right now. We're kind of in a, in a place where these planets have come together and now they're fully separated. Saturn's in retrograde. Jupiter is in Pisces, which is a really beautiful placement. It's moved like quickly through the sky, right? Pisces is a really great place for us to vision, for us to expand, for us to better understand ourselves, our gifts, the way that we want to move forward in the world. Saturn in retrograde slows things down, creates delays so that we go over every I, dot every I and cross every T. And we, you know, do all the things that we need to do to be really clear, to put systems in place, to understand what we're responsible for, to deal with certain karmas that we need to deal with. And once it starts moving forward again, I think there'll be a lot of wind in our sails to step forward and really start moving into our gifts. So this has been a really tumultuous time. It's been very intense. There's been karmas for all of us to live through like as a global community. Um, and so I feel like this is a really big moment where we can decide to like really step in and give our gifts um, or So I think this is a really important time for us to step into our gifts or to suffer not being, you know, fully expressed, not being fully in our dharma. So if you don't know what your gifts are, you've got to start somewhere. Go with what lights you up, with what makes you feel really good, with what you can do for hours and hours without thinking, um, what, you know, allows you to be of service, what allows you to feel like you can be of service without developing resentment, like you, because you have time that you're taking to write your book or to do the thing that you want to do. Um, think about like what brought you joy as a child. That's often a really good way to think about it. Like, what did you just love doing? Like, I used to just love staring at the, the, um, clouds and like, look at the sky and wonder, you know, when I was a kid. So it really relates to what I do. So that might be a good exercise to think about if you're wondering, like, what are my gifts? Yeah, that coming back to the childlike wonder is so important. It reminds me of like very alchemist vibes. Mm. Um, I love that because I feel like we've had a lot of other systems like Western astrology and human design kind of talk about this big shift that has happened. <laughs> and it's really cool to see that from the Vedic astrology perspective. And I can totally, I've been talking a lot about this because I've been in my Saturn return. My Saturn is natally in Capricorn. So this two and a half years has been like, a total shift in my life in so many ways. It's so wild when I think about it. And I'm so grateful that I had Vedic astrology. I would have been like, what on earth is going on here? <laughs> um, but it's so helpful to have these tools because then I know to work with this type of energy and it's helped me to grow so much. And now I feel so empowered. So I'm curious if you have like any tips of um, how to make right relationship with Saturn. If someone's really feeling like they're up against the obstacles and challenges right now. Sure. Yeah. I mean, you don't have to know what Saturn's doing in your chart because there's so many ways that we can be afflicted by Saturn. Um, I think the first thing is just to look at where, where are the leaks in your life? And one of the things I tell people is to make a list of things that you know you need to do that you've been avoiding and choose one every Saturday and just do them. And I call this my Saturn list. Mm. So, you know, like, I have a whole pile of sewing. There's like some organizational things like cleaning my closet and getting rid of clothes and selling, you know, books and cleaning the chicken coop. Like you just make that whole list and you choose one thing every Saturday and you do it and you don't miss, you don't miss a beat. Like Saturn really likes rhythm and consistency and responsibility and diligence and discipline. Those are all the words that are associated with Saturn, which are not sexy words, but what happens is you start to clear space for the abundance for whatever it is you're trying to create to come in and especially clarity. So as you clean your closet and do all those things, you create more clarity. So that's just one thing that you can do. Like there are esoteric remedies. You can ask a Jyotishi or a Vedic astrologer to look at your chart and actually give an assessment of like what 
area of life the obstacles in and what a remedy might be. But the best remedy is awareness, just being aware on the level of your own experience. Because a lot of times, you know, these things can take our power away. We can listen to a Vedic astrologer and then be like, but they said this and they forget, you know, we forget that they are human as well. So we have to, first of all, default to our own experience. Yeah, I love that. You have so many golden nuggets. Like, I'm so excited to share this with my community because they're going to walk away with so much insights and things to get started on their um, spiritual business journey. So thank you so much. And thank you. I'm so curious where our community can work with you um, and get more of your magic. Sure. My website is weaveyourbliss.com and I'm at weaveyourbliss on Instagram. I have a Facebook group that's called Weave Your Business Bliss and it's free to join. Um, and I go live there and talk about these different things that come up with my clients um, and also I do one-on-one, I have very limited availability. So, you, you know, if you're interested in that, you can book a call and we can talk. Um, and then I have a group program called your magnetic blueprint, which I run a couple of times a year. And that's really a deep dive into the foundations of the business, the mindset stuff that, that has really helped me get to the level of success that I'm at plus like messaging and offer creation. So just that part alone, like, um, I only let 25 people in there at this time. So I actually take everyone's chart and I have their chart. So when they come in for the Q and a, I'm sort of looking at their chart. So you do get a little bit of my magic in those moments. And like the offer creation hot seat that we do at the end alone is like super powerful. Cause you can walk away with something that you can sell right away. Wow. I love that. I'm going to have all of that linked in the show notes and definitely give Paula a follow at Weaver bliss. She has so many good insights there on her Instagram is where I follow her. Um, but I'm going to follow you on Facebook now too, because I want to see you go live every week. <laughs> Thank you so much. I, I appreciate you sharing, you know, your beautiful work with me. So I, I'm grateful to be here. Of course. Thank you so much, Paula. It was such a joy to have you. Um, and thank you everyone for listening. I will see you next time.